This episode is sponsored by the GoDaddy coupon CJC. S-I-G-9-9-C. Get a brand new dot com for just $4.99. That is 72% off the normal price. Learn more at scottsigler.com slash GoDaddy. And now let's rock and roll with a brand new book. Welcome to Fire is Orange, a short story compilation by number one New York Times bestselling author, Scott Segler. Ten titillating tales to tantalize your thoughts. Hello, junkies! We are back from SiglerFest 2K19. We held it in Vegas, and Vegas tuckered us the hell out. But since we've been back, we've gotten a couple of solid naps in, and we're ready to get at it again. Yes, new book. This is always an exciting part of the podcast. When I get to bring you a new property, we've never podcast this particular property before, and uh, we hope you dig it. This is Fire is Orange, our third in the color series of anthologies of my stories. The first anthology was Blood is Red. The second one, Bones are White. Now, Fire is Orange. Somewhere in the far future, we will do Death is Black and finish up the color series with Rot is Green. So, brand new book. It's a little bit different. Here's how we're going to do Fire is Orange. I will open up the show with my typical jibber jab, where I will showcase uh, my modesty, my complete lack of ego, uh, and uh, you know some self-deprecating action. So you know what a grounded, down-to-earth guy I am. Then we will roll into the author's notes as they are printed in the ebook of Fire is Orange and recorded in the audiobook. It's not available for print, maybe sometime in the future, but not right now. Just ebook and audiobook. The author's notes give you the history of the story, why I wrote the story, and the context if it is an official Siglerverse tale. Then we bust into the actual story itself. If the story fits in one episode, boom, that's that one episode. Foom, foom. There, I did it twice. If it's a long, oh, yeah, then we break it up into multiple episodes. If it's really, really short, oh, no, then we package it up with another short story and put them both into one episode. There's quite a bit of variety in this anthology. There are some serious stories about love. The older I get, the more I tend to write about love and how awesome and terrifying and terrible and great it can be. There are also some humorous stories. Uh, Don't be thinking there's going to be any highbrow NPR shit, all right? I still laugh at farts. I still laugh at burps to give you an idea of how mature I am in my sense of humor. So these funny stories are, frankly, they're things that make me laugh. And if you are also a mature, if you've never really matured past the eighth grade, you're going to find my humor absolutely hysterical. And then also in this collection are some really, really dark stories, disturbing stuff dredged up from my personal nightmares and a couple from today's headlines, which means that fire is orange. You never know what you're going to get. It's like a box of chocolates of fiction. Our first story in this anthology is Siglerverse official. It is a little slice of pandemic hell. Pandemic's one of my novels. So here we go with the author's notes for Dale and Mabel, then the story itself. And I hope you dig it. Author's notes for Dale and Mabel. This story was originally intended for the Apocalypse Triptych, edited by John Joseph Adams and Hugh Howey. After a few rounds of edits, they decided the story didn't quite fit with the tone of the anthology. Luckily, they asked me to do something else, which led me to The Fifth Day of Deer Camp and the two sequels, The Sixth Day of Deer Camp and The Seventh Day of Deer Camp. Those stories made it into the triptych, while Dale and Mabel did not. However, I couldn't walk away from the tale of these two lovebirds. There is something magical in stories about those who get the fairy tale. Early love then a lifetime together, doing the best they can to make each other happy. But as the pastor at my grandmother's funeral once said, all true love stories end in tragedy. When it comes to apocalyptic fiction, we're used to seeing the 20 or 30-something protagonists sprinting, yelling, lifting heavy things, fighting for their lives against impossible odds, etc. 
You know what we don't see that often? Elderly people trapped in their homes because they simply can't go anywhere else. When it comes to the end of day scenarios, those poor souls have little choice but to ride out whatever storm is brewing and hope for the best. Dale and Mabel are caught up in the horror that is Chicago during my novel, Pandemic, book three of the Infected Trilogy. In case you haven't read that series, I won't spoil it, but the Windy City is the last place you would want to be. If you've read Pandemic, I hope you dig this little vignette of two normal people experiencing the early hours of that tale. If you haven't read that novel, I now publicly shame you and suggest you cleanse your sins by buying book one, Infected, right this very moment. I do this because I'm here to help you. You're welcome. Dale and Mabel Dale pounded his fist against the lazy boy's armrest. Skip Bayless, you didn't play a goddamn down of football. What the hell do you know? Dale's wife looked up from her Kindle. She sat to his right in a matching lazy boy, the two chairs separated only by a small table that held the phone, drinks, and whatever snacks she'd made for her husband. No dinner on the lazy boys. Not ever. Dinner was at the table and had been for almost fifty years. But snacks were a different story. Dale, honey, you know the people inside the TV can't hear you, right? He waved a hand at her. Oh, shush. Super Bowl is a week away and Skip's wrinkled ass has to talk about the Bears needing a change at quarterback. That white boy can't be more than 55. Your ass is way more wrinkled than his. Listen to him and that punk partner of his, Stephen A. Smith, all smug and whatnot, Dale said, letting his anger override his wife's one-liner. The two of them. Telling Trent Dilfer that he doesn't know what the Bears should do at QB. Ridiculous! Mabel looked at the screen. Dilfer, was he a quarterback? Dale pounded the armrest again. He won a damn Super Bowl with... with... The team escaped him. Who had Dilfer played for? Dale's annoyance ticked up another notch, his frustration with the stuffed shirts magnified by frustration at his spotty memory. He'd been an NFL fan all his life, used to be a walking encyclopedia of football knowledge. Now that long-held info was just one more thing slipping away, and Baltimore, Dale said, the city finally popping into his head, with Ray Ray. Ray Ray? Ray Lewis, that retired linebacker who gets fired up about anything and everything. Oh, Mabel said. I know him. I do like that Ray Lewis. He's handsome, just like you. Dale huffed. That fucking Skip Bayless. Ridiculous. Mabel picked up the remote control and hit pause. She had made a joke to calm him down. She had compared him to Ray Lewis to calm him down, but neither had worked. Then... She went for her trump card. Dale saw Mabel reach across the little table. She softly patted his arm. Dale, sugar plum, relax, she said softly. Don't get all upset. The same thing happened five or six times a day, depending on whether Dale was watching the so-called moronic conservatives on Fox, the pink Okamis on MSNBC, the which way is the wind blowing pansies on CNN, or the self-appointed experts on ESPN. Some idiot talking head on the TV would spout gibberish that only a 30-something expert could believe made any sense at all, and it would piss Dale off. Mabel would softly remind him that he was no spring chicken anymore. Getting upset could cause problems. Getting upset could get a brother killed. A heart attack wasn't a bullet in the head by any stretch, but at his age, the end result was probably the same. Just that pat on the arm worked, though, at least a little. It worked enough to make him wonder, as he did those same five or six times a day, what he'd do when Mabel passed on and there was no one there to calm him down. She rubbed his arm. It's just a game, baby. His anger was bothering her. That meant he had to put a stop to it. Skip Bayless wasn't worth upsetting Mabel Johnson. All right, baby, Dale said. I'm all right. She leaned over her armrest, 
wincing a little when her back twanged her, as it often did, and kissed his temple. "'I'm just looking out for you, Gramps.' Dale tried to hide his smile, but couldn't. She knew just where to kiss him, right behind the eye where it tickled. A little, but not enough to make him laugh, and felt warm and soft. It felt good. It always had. I know, Grammy, he said. I know. She pulled him a little closer for a firm kiss on the cheek. The pull zinged Dale's own back. Matching injuries weren't as cute as matching chairs, mind you, but just like her, he ignored it. Quick kisses and touches were the currency of their love. They both knew there weren't that many years left until that currency ran out forever. She leaned away, then came in for a second kiss on the cheek. I was wrong, she said. You don't look like Ray Lewis. You're far more handsome than he is. More distinguished. How about I get you a beer to help you relax? She slid into her chair, used the little electric button to raise it up. Best money they had ever spent, those expensive chairs. Heated seats to ease pain in her hip and in both of their backs. Built-in vibrators to relax their sore old legs and an electric lift that put her almost at a standing position so she didn't have to struggle to sit. Mabel had a way to notch her cane between the armrest and the chair back. She pulled it out, used it to slowly walk to the kitchen. She hummed an Etta James tune, same one she'd hummed in the old days after the two of them made love. Dale wanted to get up to help her, but he knew better. There wasn't much left Mabel could do on her own. Bringing her man a beer was one of those things, and he'd learned not to say anything about it. He unpaused the TV. Skip Bayless was yammering on like a conceited idiot again. Then the picture changed. The president, on ESPN? Addressing the House, or the Senate, maybe. If it was on ESPN, it was on all the channels. Dale felt his chest tightening. War. Dirt poor American kids going off to fight in some foreign land just as he had done when he was 19. Bullets and bombs, fire, burned flesh, killing. The government could never get its fill of blood. President Sandra Blackman, wearing red, as always, babbling through the usual crap, every sentence met by Republican applause and Democrat glares. The ticker on the bottom of the screen drew Dale's attention. Infectious agent that resulted in the Detroit disaster identified. Scientists have discovered way to inoculate against the infection. President Blackman claims disease will be wiped from the face of the earth. What the hell? This ain't war. He tried to simultaneously read the ticker and listen, and also read the sidebar that flashed up all kinds of information. Goddamn news channels couldn't just give you one message at a time anymore, always beating you in the head with more than a body could manage at one time. This was about some kind of infection. An infection that could turn people into killers? What the hell was that about? Something familiar, something Dale couldn't quite place. He'd forgotten that Mabel had paused the TV. Dale forwarded until the picture was caught up in real time. Can't stress this enough, Blackman said. The Surgeon General and the Centers for Disease Control urge you to cooperate with local distribution centers to get the treatment. The emergency broadcast system will be transmitting delivery days and locations. There will be enough for everyone. Until you receive your medication, limit contact with others and stay indoors as much as possible. Mabel came into the living room carrying a beer in each hand. She set them down on the table that separated their chairs. As Blackman droned on, Dale took his beer, drank half of it in one pull. Mabel slowly, cautiously eased into her chair. The chair's electric motor hummed as she lowered it to the seated position. The president? Why'd you turn the channel? I didn't, Dale said. She's on the ESPN. The camera zoomed in on Blackman's face. She had her serious look down, cold. 
The woman knew how to work a crowd, that was for sure. Let me say I do not fault my predecessor or his party for allowing things to come to this point. These are exceptional times, not only in the history of our nation, but also of the world. Together we will forever end the greatest threat the planet Earth has ever faced. Mabel picked up the remote and again froze the picture. Dale, honey, what's going on? He took another pull before answering. Beer. One of life's glories, just as cold and nice to an old man as it was to a young one. And a beer brought by your wife? Things like that made life worth living. Some bullshit about microbes or whatnot making people killers, he said. And the government is passing out some kind of inoculant that's supposed to protect us? Inoculant, please. Like I'm supposed to believe this bullshit, the little microbes or whatever, are going to infect us and make us crazy? Mabel turned in her chair, a move that made her wince. Dale, honey, I know sometimes you don't remember all that well. You don't remember Detroit? He stared at her, then turned back to the TV. Detroit. Detroit. It was something about that, something big, but... His disloyal brain wouldn't give it up. Of course I do, he lied. Her hand again reached across the small table, but this time her fingers took his, squeezed them. He loved her with all his being, but knew her gesture meant he'd forgotten something important again. She was about to tell him what that something was, and that made him hate her. Cody Murphy, she said softly. You remember Cody? What kind of condescending question was that? Of course he remembered Cody Murphy, best white man Dale had ever known. They'd served together in Nam and stayed close all the years after, and it came back in a rush. Cody was dead. He died when Blackman's predecessor, President Gutierrez, dropped a nuke on Detroit to supposedly stop alien microbes from spreading out of the city and turning America into a nation of psycho killers. Six years back, maybe? The crushing weight of Cody's loss hit Dale all over again, fresh as the now-remembered first time. A hollow-point round in the chest. The man who had been side by side with him in the jungle was gone forever. Dale missed that man so goddamn much. Hell, he even missed Cody's wife, Lorna, even though that woman's voice was so screechy it made Dale want to pack earplugs back in the days when he and Mabel still traveled. Mabel. She always reminded Dale of the bad things. Sometimes the world was a happier place when things stayed forgotten. I remember, he said. And I don't want to. I don't want to. How could he have forgotten something like Detroit? How could he have forgotten that his own government nuked an American city? How could he have forgotten the fallout warnings? Staying in the apartment for weeks, wondering if it had been a real threat or some conspiracy thought up by the same bullshit military complex that had once sent Dale off to poke holes in Vietnamese teenagers. President Gutierrez, that liberal piece of shit, killed hundreds of thousands of Americans on the recommendation of... of... That scientist, Dale said. The one who told Gutierrez to drop the bomb. What's her name? Montoya, Mabel said, her voice still soft and patient. Margaret Montoya. Yeah, that was it. Dale felt a mood coming on, the kind where he'd yell at anyone about anything. Since the only two people in the apartment were him and Mabel, that meant he'd yell at her. Dale took another swig of beer, calmed himself. He'd been yelling at her a lot lately, taking out the frustration of his faltering mind on the one person who'd been there for him without fail for over five decades. Now, I must show you some very disturbing footage, Blackman said. This footage underscores the reason we must all work together in this inoculation effort. This is footage from a research facility where our CDC team is studying the latest round of the infection. Dale watched. 
a camera looking down into a glass cell. A young, fit white man strapped to a metal table. Triangular growths under his skin. Pyramid growths, with a black eye on every side. Those pyramids pushing, bouncing, twitching, trying to break free from the skin. Mabel's grip on his hand changed from the I'll always help you squeeze to I'm scared and you are the only one who can make me feel safe squeeze. One second she was patient with her doddering fool of a husband. The next she wanted him to be what he'd always been, her protector. He squeezed back. She picked up the remote with her free hand and turned off the TV. They sat there in silence together, thinking about what they had just seen. That young man was fucked, no question. That's what this disease did. Dale? From what they're saying on the TV, is what happened in Detroit happening here in Chicago? How the fuck was he supposed to know? Maybe, he said. Then should we just go? She made it sound so simple. They didn't even own a car. They had their groceries delivered because he couldn't manage carrying anything more than a few rolls of toilet paper from the nearby Walgreens. And if Mabel could carry her purse without dropping it, that was a good day. Their matching pair of bad backs and her shot-to-hell hip made every task an ordeal. Just this newscast alone meant the roads would be clogged. He and Mabel would be in a bus for hours, if they could even find space on one, which he doubted. Dale wasn't sure whether Mabel could handle that much time in a seat that didn't heat up and vibrate. They'd had a car when they were younger, but now what was the point? They both hated driving, and $300 a month for parking was money well spent elsewhere. And then there was something even more basic. The president told everyone to avoid contact, to stay indoors. That meant this disease, whatever it might be, was contagious. If he took his bride out of this apartment, he was risking her exposure to something that could make her want to murder. Or far worse, make him want to murder. Maybe even murder her. Dale, honey, should we go? Maybe, he said. But not yet. Not until he was more sure that Chicago was in bad shape. The president said people were distributing the inoculant, whatever the hell that was. Probably going to be crazy outside for a little while, he said. Best to stay here, stay safe. Which meant, stay close to my guns. Some of his guns were legal, some weren't. The last time Dale hadn't had a gun near him was before he reported for BASIC. Retired and elderly? Didn't matter. After those twelve months in the jungle, killing young men who were trying to kill him, Dale had decided he would never be far from a weapon. He even wanted to be buried with one just in case that Egyptian shit was right after all. If he was in his apartment, he was armed. If they left, he could take one sidearm, maybe stash a second— but he had no illusions that somewhere there would be cops and metal detectors, even for an ancient fucker like himself. That meant outside the apartment, he'd likely be disarmed. Inside the apartment, he had his Ithaca 37, the very same model he'd carried in the jungle. He used to keep it under the bed, but bending down had become a pain in the ass, so he kept it in the closet, along with a hundred rounds of number nine birdshot, another twenty-five rounds of double-ot buck. The Ithaca was already loaded. His son was all grown and gone. An almost grown granddaughter rarely came to visit. No neighbor kids stopped by. With four rounds of number nine and one of the far nastier and deadlier aught buck. Firing that last round would probably break his shoulder, but that sure beat being dead. His Colt M1911 and a Smith & Wesson Model 39, the hush puppy, kept the Ithaca company. The Colt was really only for nostalgia's sake, one exactly like it had been with him every day during that nightmare year. The thirty nine was smaller, just a twenty two, but it was the most manageable of his weapons, and nobody wore body armor on their face. If he left the apartment, the best he could hope for was to keep the Model 39 concealed. If the shit really was about to hit the fan, that wasn't enough. 
We stay, he said, for now. Stay and hope that things don't get bad. Mabel nodded slowly. She knew the score just like he did. The phone rang. Caller ID on the TV said Marcus Johnson. Mabel reached for the phone, but Dale held out a hand to stop her. Let me, he said. Her hand hovered in midair, trembling slightly, but she nodded, lowered it. She knew what he was going to say. Dale answered. Hey there, sonny boy. How's the weather in California? Dad, you watching the news? The voice, thick with concern and also with a little bit of aggression. At 44, Marcus naturally considered himself the man of the family. Dale had felt the same in his 30s and 40s, felt that his own father in the latter phase of his life might not be capable of making the right decision. Funny how what goes around comes around. And Dale now knew that his attitude then had silently pissed his father off to no end, because that's what Marcus's attitude did to Dale. Yes, we saw it. Are you getting out of the city? How's Mom? That tone, impatient, demanding. So much like Dale's own. Your mother is fine. Everything is okay, son. Just relax. Like hell, I'll relax, Dad. The Internet is saying Chicago is going crazy buying cold meds and painkillers, stuff to fight the symptoms of this thing. That means thousands of people are already infected. It's the same thing that happened to Detroit. It's not the same, Dale said. The government is going to distribute that inoculant here. That medicine is a bunch of bullshit. Another thing that was surreal about watching your little boy become a grown man, Marcus even swore, just like Dale did. The boy had inherited Dale's voice, his cursing style, and obviously his distrust for the good word of politicians. Dad, I'll be on the next plane out. And leave your wife and my granddaughter alone. That made Marcus pause. Dale felt bad for his son. He really did, because the kid was in a tough place. Come to Chicago to try and make his parents listen to reason or stay close to his wife and child in what might very well become a national time of crisis. Mabel sat still, hands in her lap. Dale raised his eyebrows, asking her an unspoken question. She didn't hesitate. She nodded. Marcus needed to be with their granddaughter. And that was all there was to it. If Marcus and his family remained safe, both Dale and Mabel were ready to face whatever might come. Son, Dale said, we're fine. If there's a problem, the Harrisons in 3A will take us with them. Besides, boy, you can't afford a damn plane ticket. The Harrisons? You're making that shit up, Marcus said. And I'm not worried about money right now. Of course you're not. You never are. Which is why you're so far in debt. It isn't about money, Dale said. But if you're too much a big man to listen to me, talk to your mother. Dale handed her the phone. Mabel took it. Your father is right, she said. We're fine. Dale watched her. She watched him back. They had to convince Marcus that all was well, or he'd charge a same-day flight to his already maxed credit cards. Dale and Mabel had each other, sure, but outside of this apartment, Marcus was the only one really looking out for them. All of their friends had either died or moved away. Those who remained were just as old as they were, just as physically compromised. The Harrisons, Mabel said. You don't remember them? Dale tried not to laugh. Lying was bad, sure, but when it came to tag team tall tales, his wife could pick up right where he left off. Mabel sat and listened to her son. Dale couldn't make out any of his words. Her eyes narrowed, hardened. In that moment, she was thirty again, speaking to a ten-year-old Marcus who had dared to disrespect her. Absolutely not, she said. Your father told you we're fine. Do you think we're helpless? Dale waited. Mabel listened. We're all right for now, she said. We have a plan if anything bad happens. You take care of your wife and daughter, Marcus. That's how you can make things easier on your father and me. Pause. That's right. Pause. We love you too, honey. Bye-bye. She hung up. Mouthy kid, Dale said. I wonder where he got it from. 
Always with the sass. Think he'll listen? She nodded. He will. I still don't know why he had to move away. Like there's something wrong with Chicago, or... This time it was Dale who reached across the table, took his wife's hand. Now's not the time for that, he said. A man has to find his own way. His wasn't here. Mabel reached to her cheek, calmly wiped away a single tear. All right, she said. Now's not the time for it. So, now that we lied to our only child about having a plan, what do we do? Marcus said the Internet said there's thousands of people already infected. Dale huffed. We didn't lie about a damned thing. We have a plan. Which is? Fortify, Dale said. In soldier terms, we defend this position against all aggressors. I'm going to make sure the guns are loaded and ready. What do you want me to do? Dale smiled. You, pretty young thing, can go get me another beer, then lie to me some more about how handsome I am. She reached over, caressed his cheek. They would face this situation like they had faced everything else for the vast majority of their lives. They would face it together. Mabel pressed the button to raise her chair. Dale did the same. That was Dale and Mabel. If you read Pandemic, you know what happened to Chicago. If you didn't read it, I can assure you that Chicago was not a fun place to be. If you are so new to me that you haven't read the Infected Trilogy, I highly advise you get on that. It's three books, Infected, Contagious, and Pandemic. Infected was the first book I had out from Crown. That was the uh, the initial, my, my big publisher debut, hardcover debut. A super fun book. And then that rolls into Contagious. Uh, those, the series stars, Perry Dossie, scary Perry Dossie. And then the series finally finishes up in Pandemic, in book three in Pandemic. So if you haven't read that yet, if you like my stuff, trust me, it's worth your money. It's worth your time. You are going to dig it. Go check out book one, Infected, at scottsigler.com slash infected. That is it for this week. We will be back next week with another slice of joy from the Fire is Orange anthology. And until then, I will talk to you all real soon. You have been listening to Fire is Orange a short story compilation by number one New York Times bestselling novelist Scott Sigler. Narrated by Scott Sigler, Ray Porter, and A. Kovacs. Produced by A. Kovacs. Engineered by Steve Rickyberg. Copyright 2019, Empty Set Entertainment. All rights reserved. For more information about the author, visit scottsigler.com. Theme music by the band Amps and Volts. 